Okay, so top of the hour. So let's go ahead and begin. Uh, this is part of a series of webinars that Reg and I have been doing on futocracy, which is really focused on designing organizations that are built for change. Up until now, we've talked about the different principles that alternate structures have used and how a synthesis of them can show a path forward to break out of the bureaucracy that many traditional hierarchies have. In this particular case, we're going to be focusing a little bit more on actually how to make that move. As we've discussed earlier, most of the companies that are using these alternate forms are either from startups or they went through a near death experience and had a visionary leader that moved the alternate structure in place as a turnaround. That leaves out the vast majority of organizations that are, that are mature operating and are really fighting the bureaucracy, want to do something different. And this discussion is how some of those organizations can move forward. The objective, the objective here today then is designing an organization that is built for change. We're going to review some of the requirements of such an organization. And again, we're gonna focus more on the more mature organizations, the large organizations that are struggling, but don't have a clear path forward and how to bridge into an alternate design. We're going to do this from a principle-based approach, looking at structural and operating principles. But more importantly, we're gonna be looking at how to prioritize the different principles and even how some of the principles are linked together such that the principles really don't stand alone. They're interconnected and those interconnections actually reinforce and strengthen some of those principles, but they also give us a path forward and how to implement them. We also know that it's very difficult to do big things at once. So we're gonna be talking about transition stages and how multiple transition stages will eventually get you to a transformation. Turning then to the requirements, what do we need as an organization? And these were derived from analysis of the challenges that organizations face today. The key here is the customer needs need to be focused and centered. This is requiring some sensing and responding quickly. The challenge here is how to actually put this into place and not just have it words, which too often is the case. We need direct lines of communication, and more importantly, we need some transparency. The traditional hierarchy runs into filtering of information, slowing down that information, such that people have to ask or be given the information they often need to make a decision. The transparency then opens up some of that to make things happen quicker. We also need a mechanism to address boundary conflicts and the decision rights. If we go into a distributed decision authority, which often is the case in these alternate structures, something needs to be put in place to really replace the controls that bureaucracy is built around. This also then requires the boundaries for those decision rights and how things operate collectively. We need something that empowers people. And this is a challenge. Too often empowerment is thought about something that is granted to you and that overlooks the ability to test the boundaries. And too often people really think that the boundaries that are constraining them are much closer than they really are. So we need something that empowers people to act in consultation if the risk is affordable and we'll come back to that principle. Key then also is the quick decision-making process. And again, it's not just quick decision-making, but those that are most knowledgeable and have a vested interest in those decisions. And collectively then, how it all gets back to alignment. These are the requirements that really are built within the traditional hierarchy, but are done so with a control mechanism. 
It's that control mechanism that really hinders the ability to get work accomplished. When we take a look then at how to focus first on the work, other alternates need to be put in place to replace some of the controls that might otherwise be lost. Moving then to the structural operating principles. These principles, the five principles, are really from a synthesis of a study of multiple alternate structures. These are companies that are operating right now. They are using principles, but when you look at them collectively, you see some commonality and you also see some gaps that we're going to be addressing. On the structural principles, the key then is to organize around work and not control. When you look at a traditional hierarchy, most of it is built around control. This needs to be done then with small networking units that are really customer facing. We talk about the need for customer facing, but usually that's around the peripheral of the organization. There's no mechanism to ripple that through the organization, nor is there often a mechanism to deal with the internal customer relationships that organizations face. Another structural principle then is the purpose alignment, such that everything is working as a cohesive unit. And even though you've got small networking units, they are aligned. That's a key component here that is built necessarily through a structural principle. In the area of operations, key for quick decision-making is autonomy and distributed authority decision rights. This is, Fairly easy said, a lot of companies want to do it, but it's not necessarily easy to do within a traditional hierarchy and needs a framework. We're gonna be talking about the framework to accomplish that. And then lastly, the necessity of having transparency, open communication throughout the organization, but pulling it all together then is an entrepreneurial spirit. This is really the effectuation as opposed to causation. And I'll be coming back to this again later because it's a critical enabling principle for the earlier principles above. There are also subordinate principles. These are the guidelines for daily activity. Here we've got effectuation mentioned again, this is moving forward with the available means. And it's really, I like to call it the entrepreneurial spirit because it's what companies want to do for a quickness and agility. There's also functional specific principles and additional principles around the decision rights, the boundaries with limits and who's involved. For the most part though, these subordinate principles will be put off to the side for more detailed implementation because where do we start? First, where do we start? That's a critical component here because the principles themselves might seem a little big and unwieldy when you take a look at the totality. So the key then is we're going to focus on the plutocracy principles, though keep in mind that this also would apply to any of the other alternate structures such as holacracy, sociocracy, the uh, Cotter's dual operating system, uh, hires, uh, microenterprises. They all really would follow very similar principles. The key then is where do you start when you have too much to do? One approach that is often done is the Big Bang. You try to do everything. While this is possible in a small startup organization, or it is also possible when the company is at a near death situation and a crisis is realized by everybody, but for the most part, this is much, much too large to do at one time. There are too many moving parts, uh, too many vested interests across the organization, and it really requires a commitment that is very difficult to do even with top level active support. The default then often is easy wins, but this sometimes becomes a little bit disjointed and it's not really a collective view of what needs to be done. The more important point then is doing some pilot tests. The pilot test then requires a second question. 
how big a scope of the test. But there's also another question here of sequence. So the scale, how do you start small? Do you scale? Where do you start? What principle do you start with? The key then here is you have to pilot test, but we're gonna do it with scope and scale combined. And we're gonna be talking about the how to accomplish this through a series of stages. The key then is the removal of approvals, looking for the greatest need in the organization, but also the desire among the people that are involved. That will give you a starting point. But again, this is really similar to most organizational change initiatives. We're gonna be then looking for balance, not too much, watching the scope, not too big, watching the scale, but also we're going to be taking a look at what can be done easily with little to no budget, which brings us back to effectuation. Effectuation then is a pathway to getting started. These are some of the principles then of effectuation, which is really a study of successful entrepreneurs. How do startups get successful when they've got limited means, limited ability. There's a series of principles involved within effectuation that we're gonna be adopting for the change initiative as well as a key principle of photocracy itself. The first principle here is really critical and it's really simply doing what you can with what you have. This is a critical difference between effectuation and causation. The normal approach is you come up with goals and then you back into the resources you need to reach those goals, such that you are always focusing on resource acquisition. Effectuation flips that around and looks at the means. What do you have in resources, people, knowledge, budget? What can you do with those resources? And that drives the goals themselves. In this particular case, then the means drive the goals. Secondly, and this is almost like a, a simple point, is you focus on what you can control. There are many things that you cannot control, so why bother worrying about them? Let's focus on doing what you can with what you can control. Critical component of effectuation. The risk is also very different here. Normally, an organization focuses on risk mitigation that reduces taking risks at all. Effectuation is very different in that risks are encouraged, but only if the loss is affordable. If the loss is affordable, you take the risk in moving forward, but you also do so with partners. This is a critical principle of effectuation because it really helps to share the risk, but it also gains additional means that you can move forward with. The partnering then is a critical component of effectuation. But lastly, is learning from what works and what doesn't work. And the critical component here is to keep moving such that you're always learning. This is often said to be something that organizations want. It's a critical part of the learning organization, part of organizational change. But for the most part, it isn't really operationalized in this manner of keep moving, learning, keep moving. Let's talk then about prioritizing and linking the principles. And then what we're doing here is we're enabling emergence. A lot of the underpinnings of what Reg and I have been doing have roots in complexity science of how to do things that enable other things to happen. The first then is to organize around work. You organize around work and not control. That's a key principle. It doesn't necessarily immediately say what to do, but it serves as a bookend for everything else in that you're constantly thinking about what do you need to do to organize around the work and not worry about the control because there's other mechanisms for control. 
Secondly, then, is the purpose alignment. Throughout the organization, a critical part of a traditional hierarchy is to maintain alignment throughout the organization for the strategy. This becomes a very unwieldy bureaucratic process, but there is a necessity of purpose alignment. But there's also the necessity of autonomy with distributed decision making. You now have two principles that are somewhat contradictory of having a purpose alignment, but at the same time, the individual pieces having autonomy. This then sets up a creative tension between the two, such that you're allowed to set some boundaries, pull things back into alignment, but within those boundaries, there are great opportunities for individual activities for the autonomy and distributed decision-making. This is a critical component of what Reg and I have been focusing on, is the connection between purpose alignment and distributed decision-making and how to put those into a balance. There's also another component here where effectuation comes into place again, and that's an entrepreneurial spirit that is a critical component of how the decision-making is accomplished. The earlier slide where we talked about the principles of effectuation really gives guidelines to individual leaders within the distributed organization on how to accomplish their activities without asking for permission or explicit authority from a traditional hierarchy. What you then have is a purpose alignment in tension with distributed decision-making the distributed decision-making is really enabled by the entrepreneurial spirit and really connected between two bookends of organizing around work and organizing with transparency of operation so that people understand what's happening throughout the organization. They're making sense of what's happening without having to uh, basically question or rely on the rumor mill. We then have a series of principles that are operating collectively and interconnected with how they support each other. But there's also how you actually organize the people, the structure of the organization. We struggled some with what to call this because it's not a hierarchy. The levels of an organization are not your traditional positional levels. We're going to be talking about functional levels of the organization. The first functional level is really the middle, and that's a functional level two, which is your purpose alignment team. The purpose alignment also does the network weaving. This is a proactive approach to how you keep the organization aligned and also how to uh, really proactively manage the network itself. Connected to that then is the individual network of teams. Here's this, what I found. Yep, something's going on. Okay, let me, let me keep going here. Is there a problem, Reg? Guess not, okay. Um, let me keep going here. The positional of the level one is really where the work is accomplished. The networking of teams, this is the operational support task throughout the organization. But you see there's a tight connection between level one, level two, such that there's purpose alignment that is overseen, not positionally, but communications such that the alignment team sees issues, sees opportunities, doesn't mandate action, but convenes teams or convenes groups of people to create action that is needed. The positional alignment then is really replaced with purpose alignment. And that purpose alignment is accomplished by observing and initiating action without taking action itself. 
The third level then is your traditional top of the organization, which is strategic direction, but it's also critical that it is the external relationships that are often mandated by regulatory agencies or in many areas also serve as strategic partnerships that are critical to the organization and the opportunities. We now have then five operating and structural principles put together into a three functional level organization, which is quite different from a traditional hierarchy. The critical components now is how do we move forward with transition, transition stages that will eventually move into transformation. We are not going to be talking about a simple hub and spoke startup, and we're not going to be talking necessarily about a uh, near death turnaround. We're going to be focusing on the larger number of organizations that are traditional control based hierarchies, often with bureaucratic silos. That is our starting stage that we're going to move forward to a vision of the future where the organization is designed for change. Level one then is really building a futocracy foundation. It's starting to address the core issues in the organization, but doing so from a principle-based approach. And it's also going to start to address the middle management issues. When you flatten organization, oftentimes the middle management is where the pushback occurs because they're the ones that are losing uh, positional power and also in many cases numbers. Within futocracy, there's a number of places that these people can go. Some of them may move down and lead a network team at level one in the organization, but also a critical component here is where do they fit within the purpose alignment. That's stage one. Stage two then will move into photocracy in action. It's starting to put the principles into place. Stage one really starts the conversation. Stage two starts to move the pieces and actually implement some of those principles. Stage three then is really full photocracy that is principle driven and is really moving to an adaptable ecosystem. This is a critical component in that all the pieces are coming together and it's operating as a series of tightly interconnected ecosystem components. Moving forward then, let's take a look in more detail of these three stages. This stage again is the foundation for the photography. It is starting to change the conversation and also involve middle management in the issues. First then is really a discussion point. It's adopting the concept of we are organizing around work, we're not organizing around control. That is a conceptual shift, but with that discussion comes a number of rethinking of how things are done in an organization. This is a critical component then, while it doesn't necessarily change anything explicitly, it changes how people are thinking about the organization. Similarly, the introduction of the operating principle of effectuation starts to come into play in that we start to rethink how decisions are made and how we think about risk, how we think about our goals and what we use to set those goals. These two components then are really critical in how we start to think about the organization itself. We also then start to focus on the alignment of work, focusing on tasks and not roles. Too often we get involved with what people do as a position versus how all the individual pieces work together. This is a more systems thinking approach to the totality of work. These three components then really set the stage for thinking about the organization and how it operates. It is a change in conversation that the middle management needs to be involved with, but it's really a conversation across the organization. 
that is in combined with starting up a purpose alignment team. This can start as a ad hoc team that starts to look at the bigger issues of the organization, what's working, what's not working, and start to think about how the organization needs to be shifted around such that controls are not keeping work from occurring. This is a collective membership that's looking at key people throughout the organization to have an understanding of how work is accomplished and how to optimize that work relative to the purpose. Stage one then has really two aspects. The first three bullet points here are focused on the mental model of the organization, the discussions and conversations we have about the organization. And then that is started to be put in place with a specific team that starts to think about what the organization needs and how it might better accomplish it. Again, this sets up the foundation for stage two. This is where the pieces start to come together. First is the network weaving. This can be done where you're starting to pilot test and scale a new structure, looking at a functional level one. What parts of the organization can be split out into a network and start to operate that. When you look at a traditional organization, the hierarchy is the formal aspect, but within the information systems and the informal network of how people daily communicate, there's already a network structure in place. This is examining that structure and starting to make it a little bit more explicit. It also involves starting to create multifunctional task force teams that can be really looking at the organization, starting to address problems, create cross-organization linkages, such that the focus here then is how to create the network that may be informal, but make it more explicit here. We can also in stage two then start talking about distributed decision-making. This is the autonomy of people making the decisions within their area of influence in the organization, but supported with effectuation. The effectuation gives them the guidelines on how to do those decisions, along with some support then for connectivity as necessary. There's, this is where there's an activity connected with the first and two, second levels of the organization, such that the individual teams don't work fully independently they're tightly connected with the organization that they have a direct work relationship, but there's also other communities of practice, knowledge sharing, and problem identification, problem sharing, where the purpose alignment team can identify those common issues and make the connections. Again, the purpose alignment team's role in that case is not necessarily to do the activity or direct the activity, but to bring the people together that will enable the activity. The decisions then start to be resting with the team and more of those decisions are pushed down into the team with a purpose alignment. Okay. There's also a move toward transparency. This is a self-serve of information that is required to do, do the work. Too often, the hierarchy is a gatekeeper of information or even the IT is a gatekeeper of information versus a service organization. So it's again, thinking about what information is needed and how to make that information readily available such that people can self serve for it. At this point then we've taken the foundation for stage two and we started to put some of the principles together into connectivity and prioritization of how they operate together. Moving to stage three then is really your full photocracy that's principle driven. This is all the components that are working together, but also requires some customization. So for example, a project-based organization is gonna have a different version that is more budget driven objectives. On the other hand, a micro enterprise 
ecosystem such as the higher group is really looking at P&L responsibility at each micro enterprise as well as how the ecosystem comes together. This is where many organizations can operate, but again, to operate at this level, the P&L responsibility requires full transparency. And that's why transparency was set up in stage two, because without that transparency, you cannot get to a P&L across the ecosystem of microenterprises. But again, this is for a line organization or a service, internal service delivery, but it may not necessarily be for a project-based organization, different objectives, different variations of a stage three. Nonprofits can also be involved where there's a social objective, in which case at the stage three, the sub principles start to come to the fore of how to modify the basic foundation such that it works as a collective network with distributed decision-making. We then have talked about implementing alternate structures at this point. We focused first on the five principles that are consistent with many of the alternate structures that we've seen in other organizations. Again, these other organizations for the most part have been startups, smaller organizations, or they went through a near death experience that forced a crisis and a visionary leader stepped in to put together an alternate structure. We've talked about those principles, but then how those principles have linkages between them and that the principles are not isolated, but they support each other and can be put into place through stages in an organization such that collectively, by the time you get to a full third level, you start to customize and you have true transformation within an organization. We then have a principle-based approach for implementing alternate organization structures. Let me stop the share and open it up for discussion. Okay, Reg, you've been following. Any any comments as I catch up? No, <clears throat> excuse me. No, there's uh, a, a couple of questions that came up during the presentation which uh, I'll just cover quickly. Um, where are we? Yeah, the first question was from Amber, does it flow up and downwards? And because the arrows on the diagram made it look like it did, and, uh, or is it circular? Uh, I said it's neither. It uh, is functional network of networks. And so, even with the network, it's not a circular um, relationship. It's relationships with other parts of the network as is necessary and appropriate. <clears throat> and the link um, you touched on with the Network Weaver is how the um, purpose alignment team helps the functional uh, teams on level one to align themselves and achieve the work that's needed to be, a work, uh, to be achieved within their own leadership process. And an and, uh, and, and answer to Amber and for the others, Ross and I have struggled for, for over a couple of years on how to draw this diagrammatically. Um, we've drawn it as networks. It doesn't, and without 3D, it doesn't really look very good. Um, and, and so we use different variations according to what we're trying to discuss. And so it, it might be confusing for some that it looks hierarchical. And the network <clears throat> networks also, you, you think about combining the work activities where people are in the different network teams, but there's multiple dimensions of how people are networked they have uh, personal relationships, they have previous work experience relationships, they have cross organization teams, they have uh, functional commonalities. All of those are different networks. While we focused here on the work relationship part of the networks, the network weaving is really looking at all those different types 
of networks and how they all work together. Uh, but again, that's, that's difficult to present without looking at layers and really a really messy network uh, design itself. Or I should say a, a messy network illustration that matches the messiness that we deal with daily uh, as a routine. Yeah, I'm just pulling up on the on my computer um, an alternative vision that we've used before, just to show that difference. Okay. okay. Um, and I can just quickly put it on the screen to go ahead. Go ahead. illustrate that. Bear with me one second. So let's put this on here. I'll go ahead and share. Yep. Yeah, it's just trying to get it to allow me to do it. Okay. Yep. Just bear with this while it. Yeah, that, this is showing uh, the di different parts moving. I don't know why it's not working. This is good old PowerPoint on a Mac. Ignore that white stuff. Um, <laughs> I, I really don't know what's happened here. Uh, um, basically, it's trying to, um, to show you here that the equivalent of the executives is this part of the network that's plugged in to the purpose alignment team. And that consists of a varying number of um, experts in different fields, which are not necessarily the experts that you would find um, in the executive or senior management level of an organization. We're looking for a different type of person here as opposed to the traditional approach. And these teams are basically collaborative in the ways that are necessary. And then the network weaver is working amongst the, the network, working with the information technology systems, the purpose alignment team, and the different forms of leadership of these teams, which each organization will decide what type of leadership is appropriate for their teams, whether it's a consensus approach with alternating leadership or whether it's set team leaders, project leaders, program managers, whatever type it is. And the network weaver role is to help them coach them and form some form of arbitration and so forth as is necessary. So it is a complete network because this isn't hierarchical. It's a sort of a part of the network. So I hope that uh, it, it explains what we're trying to, to show here. Okay, and Amber and others, if you would like to go off mute, uh, please please do so. Um, thanks, uh, thank thank you all for for having this. Um, I'm working on some similar projects currently, and this this image kind of it, I would be the network weaver on the projects that I'm working on, and where I'm struggling is the board presence in these spaces. Um, they're all nonprofits and some of them aren't even um, like they're not even registered organizations. They're just convening um, convening other community organizations. Um, so in, in a, using the nonprofit industrial complex, you know where we want to go to is something like this, you know, how are you breaking down the board to come to flatten that? From creating, uh, let, let me see if I understand what you're saying. You're, you're a network weaver now and you're trying to put together the, a, a, a somewhat operating network already of nonprofits. Uh, yes, around okay. like, City that goals. Around like city goals. 
Okay. So some of these organizations are registered and some of them aren't. All right. Uh, I think a critical part there is not only network weaving, but also purpose alignment in making explicit of what are the missions of the different organizations and how they align. And by making that explicit, making additional connections, but connections with a purpose, in which case you're not necessarily doing things or directing activities, but you're bringing people together that causes something to happen just because they are together. The, the problem is every time people try to do this, they want a board of directors. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I think before you can move to anything like this, this configuration of the executives and the boards and so on, this is something that collectively they've got to agree to. Because what, what I've found in many of these situations is if each one of these was an independent organization and they're trying to achieve something in society, there are tremendous overlaps in what they're doing because they're fighting for the same sort of funding um, authorities and so forth. And, uh, and it's helping them understand that by having a collective perform uh, purpose alignment team, then this overlapping can either be monitored more effectively and have less impact or take it out completely so that each part is helping to achieve the overall purpose. And then the uh, boards and the shareholders then have to have a similar sort of mindset because you only need one group or even an individual who pulls together what this collective organization is trying to achieve. And you get this in social services and all sorts. They're all trying to achieve the same thing in different ways and it causes chaos and disharmony. So this is where I would focus first is this relationship between the board idea and bringing together the purpose alignment. Thank you. To some extent, if they're focusing on the individual boards, um, that may be a challenge of them wanting to silo too, versus yeah. possibly making connections between the different organizations as to share board members, thereby establishing a network at the board levels. Yeah, I mean, I, I can understand Amber's problem because many of these different organizations are set up for different emotional reasons and have different histories. And, and unless you deal with that part of it, I don't think you'll ever get alignment. And I, I think though, making things explicit also of what each is trying to accomplish and look for areas of commonality, even if it is a tangential commonality, but make those explicit as to why there's benefit in working together versus working alone. Uh, there's probably also a little bit of fear of poaching for funding. Mm -hmm. But again, if you have an effectuation standpoint, you know, look at it from a partnership of means of what can you partner with each other and leverage others means to benefit yourself too. Yep. So by making explicit what are the available means or resources each has that may be shareable in new ways can also strengthen how they network together. Um, Would you agree, Reg, that that comes after, you know, at a high level, the vision has to be shared. It has to be agreed, understood, and have the leadership motivated and engaged to enable to your point that to be distilled out because it sounds like this lack of clarity um on the ground yeah i mean i i i think the uh, social organizations and voluntary organizations even the united nations all suffer from the same thing you have wonderfully minded people with tremendous skills going in 
a similar direction, doing things differently and fighting for the same sponsors and money and so forth. And so when you actually look at their effectiveness over time, it's very limited to what it could be. And, and this comes from the top. It's this fighting at the top for being part of, um, I don't know, being more visible and getting more money and so on. And, and many of these organizations, and it's worth looking at these others to see how they measure the success because many parts of these organizations' success was measured by how much money they can get in and use each year and very little measurement on the effectiveness of its use. Thankfully, that's changing in the current climate and we're getting more towards the effectiveness. But in the uh, voluntary social sector, that still isn't the case in my experience. And, uh, and these are the things I think you need to focus on first so that the sponsors and the givers of the funding get the best buck for their bucks, basically. And you can only do that if you get these executives together and agree a way forward collectively. I mean, Amber, does that link into your experience of what you're trying to do now? Um, yeah, I... Um... Uh, so I'm in the United States and I'm in, I'm in Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh and we have the most philanthropic dollars in the country. Mm -hmm. So our foundations perpetuate this scarcity mindset where it makes it hard to build those, these collaborative networks. So that one of the projects I'm working on is doing this and the consultant that came in to build the foundation did not develop a board or, or a governance structure that wasn't hierarchical. So mm -hmm. I'm going, I'm coming back in to say like the, a lot of work you already did is not good for what you're trying to accomplish and trying to explain to the foundation that the hierarchical board model in regards to justice or equity work, um, especially racial equity um, doesn't lend itself to collaborate with other organizations, right? All the decisions are made by a small group of people versus a community. All the decisions are, I'm already running into everything being politicized where mm. the things that um, we're advocating for is equity, transparency, and community government. Those aren't things, I wanna say they're apolitical, but if we had the, if we had true equity or true transparency, then we would be more prone to make better decisions for whole communities. Um, so the problem running, running into are all these organizations that are coming to the, these network organizations coming in, their organizations are flawed and hierarchical. So all they know is how they're treated or how their organization functions. Then they bring that dysfunction to the circle, to that mm. network and mm. that network that dysfunction feeds back into like the the convening table, and the it, and it's just like dysfunction that I'm just seeing in all these circles where it's like I can't create a flat organization or a flat table to convene all these organizations if they're coming in with dysfunction from their hierarchical organizations. Yeah, I mean, just uh, a couple of comments on that. One of the things that I've found, because I did a, a lot with the UN and other voluntary organizations, not the UN is a voluntary organization. Um, what I found is if we celebrate where they are now and get them to collectively together and say, look, let's celebrate where we are now. Now let's look how we can take this forward and be even more successful. And I got them to think in terms, and this may sound a strange approach, um, and that's the circular economy. Now, people think of the circular economy about waste reuse and, and all this sort of stuff, but it, it's more, much more than that. It started off as that. And it's about relationships and working together to get the overall best use of all the resources. And, and so it's that sort of mindset that I try to introduce into the senior people of these organizations so that they are seen as even more effective, more powerful, if they work in this collective way, in this circular economy type approach. And, uh, and I have to say that it has some success when you take it down that route. If, if, if we blame them for their hierarchy not being effective, 
then all we do is get defensive behavior and, and we don't go forward. <laughs> yeah, I, I try, I do try not to blame them, but I have introduced like a do, that donut economy model um, to several mm -hmm. leaders. And what, what I will say is like, especially region that I'm in circular economies are only spoken about in the sustainability space. Yeah. And the work that I do, I try to bring sustainability into people and people into place. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah, so it's not blaming them, but it's just like, there's so much development that needs to happen that I'm, I'm struggling with development through the, like learning through the, the project or learning through your errors, because there's just like circular, a lot of folks in social service work do not work with an economic lens. Yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah. the struggle. I mean, if you pick up what Ross was saying earlier, work with what you've got. If you've got a couple of these groups who are willing to go down this route, then work with them and get them to start working together, using the resources more effectively together and align their purposes. Once that success is seen, I'm pretty sure the others will want to join in. Yeah, that, I'm, that's what, yep, that's what I'm gonna try to do. I mean, what do you think, Ross? Um, I, I agree of, I've run into similar situations with the nonprofits. Um, they're so focused on their objective that they lose sight of, of really the bigger issues and the interconnections. Uh, but again, to the extent that it is possible to identify those that have a desire that do see the bigger picture and by making those connections and um, really align areas of alignment more explicit, things can happen and uh, you know, take the progress as you can get it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, Maynard, I'm not sure exactly which slide you want. Is this a slide you're after? Uh, no, okay, let's see. All right, let me just step back. Okay. <clears throat> okay, any other, any other questions that come up? Jeez. Okay, I think this is a slide that, <clears throat> This slide also was where we were just talking with Amber about of the variations of the nonprofit, uh, how they're a little bit different, need to be modified due to uh, really different dynamics. Maybe, maybe this slide was that picture that I put up, Morse. That could be too. Uh, let me go ahead and stop share. Maybe you could put your picture back up again. <clears throat> okay. Other questions that have rattled around. Let me take a look. If no one's going to ask any questions, I'm going to ask questions because go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> like this, this is what I'm working on. Okay, so if we're looking at, say we're um, we're looking at this in not in a nonprofits, not in a nonprofit space in general, but maybe a space where nonprofits and for profits, maybe smaller or medium sized businesses, are. I would say, quote unquote, lobbying together for some kind of like change. Um, how would you recommend or how would you, how could you foresee that type of like level three board engagement flattening happening? Because like, that's where eventually I want to move this to is bring, bring in the for-profit spaces and the entrepreneurs and small businesses um, into this space, but they all, what's weird is I feel like their workplaces are less toxic <laughs> than the nonprofits, but, um, 
the decision making and the operations and communications look much different in those spaces than in nonprofit spaces. Can you give us an example? So if we're like looking at this, um, I'm gonna thank you for sharing that Maynard. I'm just copying everything in the notes. Um, so if we look at the image where we have the pink circles, right? Yeah. Let's say the first pink circle is the topic area is housing. The second pink circle, the topic area is education. And the third pink circle is public safety or yeah. And in those boxes, it's a mixture of nonprofits and for profits. Mm -hmm. And that yellow, that yellow objective or that yellow thing is like the table that's like advocating for or lobbying for policy change. And then that green circle would be the executives of that table. But that that green circle is a mixture of small businesses and nonprofits too. So their their communication styles are different. Their um, their operations and workflows are different. Their decision making processes are different. Yep. And both and not neither neither of which have a, a, a like this like a flat space or a flat governing body, right? But it's more complicated because you have different types of businesses working towards one objective. How how do you how would you foresee like that conversation? Or I guess my what my head is is like to tell them to throw away everything that they're used to doing in their own companies and <laughs> just come to this circle under a new structure. I think you come back to what Ross was saying about principles. You've got the, the core principles on, and then the decision making that you were talking about. If you start to have principles on decision making, then you can collectively between the, the profit and the nonprofit agree what those principles are within which the decisions are made. And so you start a different conversation which then allows them to understand that they have to work differently. So for example, this first circle here, this first one would be more of a program rather than a project team or something. It's a program. And within that network in the program, you have individual projects, some of which are uh, undertaken by profits, others by nonprofits, but they're working collectively uh, within the principles of decision making and other forms of sub principles within the overall organization with the purpose alignment team helping them keep on track within their program so each project is working for the same outcomes the same purpose and uh, and then with the network weaver is working between the two to help coach between particularly in the early stages, the nonprofits and the profits, how they can work together, speak the same language, start to develop the same sort of values that they can work within within their program. And I would take it one step at a time. And, and I then, once that one's working, I would start then to encourage this group to start working in a similar way. And they can teach each other at this level and also bring their people in at the purpose alignment team. Um, it's taking this one step at a time uh, approach is, is very important. Maynard also has a similar uh, issues reading from the chat where there is a collection of nonprofits and for-profits working together. The alignment though is challenging the individual purposes are somewhat tangential, but there's also an additional issue that he brought up, and that is one of engagement, and that some of the people are really not engaged or engaged only briefly. And the critical aspect here is to the extent that you've got the level three at or the board levels of across the collection, if they can identify some of the key people, or if you can identify some of the key people who are really more of the achievement oriented or see the bigger picture or want to 
move forward. The people that are more the networking people and want to see what others can help them with, if you can pull them together into a purpose alignment team, that then can really serve as a vehicle to understand each other to the extent that the purpose alignment team in this case is a membership of the individual level one organizations, which are in this case would truly be standalone organizations, that becomes a sharing and understanding sense-making mechanism that can then bring others in uh, as opportunities are identified. Yeah, I, I mean, I would agree with that. I would also add that if you have problems of engagement, this is a symptom. And, and so it's trying to identify in that organization what's creating this lack of engagement. Um, one of the key ones, and if you're interested on the network, there's a paper on futocracy and uh, people, which really challenges what most organizations use today, the strategic human resource management approach where you have shareholder purpose and the staff purpose, they're not necessarily the same. And you've got the business purpose in the middle somewhere. Um, and, and so since HHRM came in and, and this so-called strategic alignment of the activities and development of people, uh, since almost to the day that that came in, workforce engagement has actually got less and less and less. And, and so there's a real cause and effect here. And, and so with futocracy, by bringing back the ability to make decisions, to develop as the uh, environment and customer requirements are emerging and different and different technology, but then particularly with the, the younger generation now who really want to be involved more in a, in a totally different way to certainly my generation, um, you start to get greater engagement again. And, and so the two go together. It, it's coming to a, a system where we, we take away this command and control up here with the executives. We have the purpose alignment team reports to the executives because they are representing what the executives are trying to achieve for the overall organization without the executives having any day-to-day -day contact whatsoever with level one. And, and level two are making sure that everything is going online but still enabling these people to really take the organization forward. They, they pretty much are best to make the decisions that are necessary, provided they've got the right focus and direction. And then you get your engagement back. Yep. And, and certainly that's my experience. Now, the purpose alignment team is critical, and that's why we put it in stage one. And it's often the missing piece on some of these alternate structures. By putting together a network and transparency, a lot of things happen, but it's missing the proactive piece of identifying what needs to happen that's not happening. The yeah. sense-making, the convening of people, the network weaving, that's all really critical on the purpose alignment team. And that's why we added that as a core principle to what we're doing, because it, it really moves beyond just moving the, the organization around into a network structure is how to think forward of what that network, network structure should be and how it can evolve itself as opportunities come up. And importantly, it breaks down this silo mindset because they're collectively responsible for the outcome of the organization. And so it's no good fighting now for individual budgets and uh, sort of showing their presence with the board and so forth, because it's a collective responsibility here. Um, yeah, and it's also a, a shift in how you think about the control and influence itself. A lot of times we think of like middle management of being able to direct things, make things happen. But as we all know, that really is somewhat limited to the, the followers willing to follow and do things. The, the real power of the purpose alignment team is the convening and identification of issues. And then once identified, really turning it over to others so they can move on to other bigger issues. These are the types of things that are normally lost in the daily firefighting activity. So you know, 
pull people out from that firefight and let them look at what needs to be looked at for the bigger issues, what needs to be really done. And that enables then the tactical strategic decision making to be made up here in order to, to deliver the purpose and then ensure that these resources are all being used in the most appropriate way with the support of the network weaver and the leadership of the teams. And uh, in, in that way, the whole organization's moving in the same direction. Now we're, because that's kind of like how I'm envisioning this. And, you know, but I'm all, what I'm always going to go back to is like how the board stifles that strategy from the, the purpose alignment team. And I, th I think I'm just going to always be there until people, <laughs> until people, because like, even if we have like a values based uh, exercise, we get alignment, right? That this still the, the decision making of that team, are they the decision makers? Well, you have different types of decision, don't you? You've got strategic, operational, all sorts. I would say the operational decisions are made here at level one. The higher level strategic decisions in order to achieve the purpose are made at level two. And that's why they're optimizing their use of the resources. They're identifying where the issues are with the network weaver, who then with the teams works on how to resolve those. And the direction of the organization, what business it's in and so forth is level three. And one of the problems is level three, because they've come up through traditional hierarchical organizations, aren't able to let go of the lower level decisions. And I can give you examples of CEOs deciding who's going to be a cleaner in their company of, of 10,000 people. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, but it, some of these people are like this. And so this is why I come back to my earlier comment. It's only by having this discussion at this level and really helping them make sense of how ineffective their current processes are, but they have to come to that conclusion. Um, otherwise, we're just sort of getting them to agree for a week and then it all changes back again next week. Um, until that decision is understood and they're willing to try something different and let go, but then you come into trust. And very often they say, but Reg, I don't trust my, my next level. Uh, if I leave them alone five minutes, it all goes to hell. Well, let's, let's look at that. Yeah, let's find what is it about them that they don't trust and how do we resolve that trust? And what, what do they need in order to gain that trust? Because if you don't get that sorted at this level, these levels, this won't work. And it won't work in a hierarchical organization either because they're too busy now setting up task force and fire brigade teams to try and bring catch things back to where they should be. And we start developing organizational heroes in task forces, which is a recipe for disaster. And it all stems here, this relationship. I think you I think you got it. Now I now I got it, Reg. <laughs> <laughs> Now I got it. Now that's because that's exactly the crux of it is the trust. And it, like on one of my, one of the working groups that I put together, I feel like one of the executive organizations put one of their like organizers on it because she doesn't trust what I'm doing with that working group. Yeah. yeah. Amber, uh, we're, we're working with, a couple situations already to test these ideas. L let me make an offer to see if we might do something similar with you and offer our assistance with what we've got here, but at the same time, uh, help us learn a little bit more about some of the difficulties and moving forward to further refinement for implementation. Um, I, I would love that. I know I've been reaching out to organizations and I'm, you know, in our country, this is, I would say a fairly new movement, but I've been trying to build flat organizations for a couple of years now. Okay. 
And yeah, I, again, a lot of what we're doing is we're still learning, filling in some of the gaps uh, as we go forward. Yeah, uh, definitely focusing on, you know, how like Reg was explaining the level one, level two, the type of decisions being made. I really think that's my my gap and my gap in communicating to them the how the hierarchical structure is slow yep. and it's not it's also self-defeating in that if you're not giving people the autonomy to engage and to be part of um the decisions being made about their life <laughs> yeah. they, you know that's that's what we're here for i thought <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Again, part of it is that you know, when you're inside the box, you don't know the box exists. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's easy to say someone to get out of their box and break their paradigm, but uh, it requires a lot more explicit uh, feeling, feeling the edges, the feeling the limitations and coming to an understanding that there are alternatives. Um, your situation reminds me of something for me in the 70s where my colleague who was my mentor and I, we were determined in the public sector that they would change and they would de behave differently, etc. And we wore ourselves out trying to do it. And we sat in a pub one evening with the dogs. We'd just come back from a long, hot walk and we sat with a pint of Guinness. And we both looked at each other and laughed and said, hey, we're bloody arrogant because we think we know better than them. Let's go back and ask them how they can work better and see what we can do. And that's what we did. And we started to move mountains. And, and so I always remember that, that pint of Guinness in this old English pub in the countryside, that if we can get where they be there where they are and then help them understand how that box looks and its impact on them and how we can support them to make them even more effective and their egos grow with it. And, and so if you want, as Ross said, he and I uh, can support you and help you um, not by solving your problems, but certainly asking you some difficult questions and, uh, and so forth to, to help you move forward. Yeah. And you know, how, however you all want to get set up, if you have a process that you're, you know, like some standard way of like some feedbacks or I don't know how, how you all do this, but yeah, I'm again, like I'm kind of by myself doing this because there aren't a lot of folks trying. Um, so I would love that type of support. Okay. Well, we'll contact you outside of this meeting. Um, we don't have set ways. We have ways that meet what we're trying to achieve at the time with the person. So it's a live ongoing process. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, any other questions from the other participants that are still online? Well, I think we are coming to the end. It's been an interesting conversation and we appreciate your interest. Looking forward to uh, continuing the discussion uh, further on the Change Management Network as questions come up. Again, this is a work in process. We are continuing to uh, add further detail, but at the same time, we don't want to make it overly complicated. Uh, when you take a look at some of these alternate structures, the, they change one type of bureaucracy for another, and we're trying to avoid that. So we're trying to make it simple and let the principles carry the weight, but make the principles be self-explanatory also. Any other comments before we end? Reg, anything else on your side? Uh, just Amber, you might find the uh, HR paper helpful in understanding how to look at the roles and functions of people in a totally different way, which then might help you with your conversations. Where's the HR paper at? <laughs> it's on the network. Um, oh, okay, okay. Look on the network for that. Yep. Okay. And if you look under Futocracy, you'll find it there. Okay, thank you.
Excellent. I'll start there. I thank you for, for adding to our understanding through your questions and looking forward to additional uh, online discussions and future webinars. I wish you all to have a good day and we'll connect online later.